Hello, and welcome back to Soteriology 101. As you can see, we have a guest with us today that you are all very familiar with. Dr. Braxton Hunter, welcome back to the program. Glad to be here, Leighton. Thanks so much for having me. For those that don't know Braxton, you should know him. Uh, he is the president of Trinity Seminary, where I happen to be a, a professor, and I love working with Braxton and Jonathan Pritchett, who many of you know as Pritchett Prime. And uh, we, we appreciate so much him taking the time today to come on the program. Uh, Braxton, how, I, I should probably know this. I'm ashamed that I don't. How many books have you authored or co-authored that you have out there? Uh, Ten, if you count ones that I've contributed to. Nine, if you just count uh, my books. Okay. But that, that I have nine or ten books doesn't mean that they're any good. It just means I have nine or ten <laughs> That's books. That's not true. I've read several of them, and the one of the ones I've read, I I think that they're all very well written. You're very very good at your craft. Well, um, and and you've got fiction books as well, uh, yeah. which is interesting because that's that's a whole another realm of writing style. So you're kind of like the modern day C.S. Lewis that you don't just do theology stuff. You also you know jump right in there to the to the fictional world too. Well, I appreciate yeah. that. Actually, it's funny you mentioned that because just last night I got a message from someone who was an atheist and actually came to Christ reading the fiction books. So that's uh, it's, it was all worth it if just for that person. That's right. Well, hey, you know, um, somebody, an uh, idol killer there, which is Warren McGrew, uh, he says these thumbnails are awesome. I don't know if you saw the thumbnail before you got on uh, at uh, Caleb Garza is the one who puts those together for us. He does a great job. Way to That's go, Caleb. Uh, and I, I did, it just dawned on me like right before I, I started with you and you, you signed on Brex and I thought, Oh no, you know, um, James White and his, uh, his followers are going to grab this and go, look, Leighton thinks he's the judge, you know, <laughs> instead of God being the judge, Leighton's going to think he's the judge. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. I can see that already, already beginning to happen. That's uh, cool. And no, obviously, God, uh, God is the judge. We all believe that. But today, we're going to bring oh, getting to happen. Uh, uh oh, I, I did hear I did hear um, my own voice come back through all of a sudden for some reason. That was strange. Um, I may, may, I'm just hearing something. Um, anyway, I, I wanted to spend some time today talking about what I know you and I have talked about in other broadcasts. Uh, personally, even you know through our Marco Polo back and forth, Braxton, you and I have discussed some of these things. Uh, I've heard you talk about them in debates with atheists. Um, and, and it really has to do with the concept of the, the intuition that we have. Uh, it's referred to in, in this particular clip that we're going to play from an interview uh, with John Piper over his new book, The Providence, uh, just called Providence, actually. Um, and, uh, and I'll do some more broadcast on, I think, this book. I've ordered the book Providence from John Piper because I, it's going to it's going to be loaded full of uh, material that I think we can cover and go through and, and pick out what we feel is the misinterpretations of the Calvinistic perspective. He's going to give us a lot of material. You know something, Leighton, as I was listening to the clip, uh, the video that the clip comes from, um, it sounds like it actually could be a useful book because of the way he has tagged everything. All the verses on election, all the verses on this or that or the other. Although I did think, well, if you've got a good, a good uh, edition of Logos Bible software, you've already got that. But it, it does look like it could still have some utility. Yeah. Well, um, I, I think you're right. I think it's going to give us a, a kind of a go to place for us to at least to demonstrate what Calvinism entails, because that seems to be one of the major issues that I run into all, over and over again is instructing Calvinists on what Calvinism actually is, because it seems to me that uh, many Calvinists of different stripes think that I have misrepresented Calvinism because I don't represent their form of Calvinism. And John Piper is arguably the most influential Calvinist living today. Um, and if, if at least I can demonstrate that he believes what I am contending with, then you can't accuse me of misrepresenting Calvinism qua Calvinism, true Calvinism as it's depicted by the leading scholars and so um, it, it will definitely serve that purpose of nothing else. Um, the clip that we're going to play here really gets into this, what these called these assumptions, which we're, we're going to talk about the intuitive beliefs, the beliefs that we have intuitively about the nature of reality. And I'll, I'll give one example that I believe you've used before in debates with atheists, um, the, the intuitive belief that you exist. So, for example, Braxton, if I were to walk up to you and say, uh, you, you believe that you exist, you believe that you're a real person that actually is a sentient being, um, but you don't. This is more like the matrix world. 
you're just more of a figment of your own imagination. Um, you really don't exist. Then it would seem to me in that, that statement that the burden of proof would be on me to demonstrate how your intuitive belief, your assumption that you exist isn't true. Is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, typically what we say about uh, the burden of proof is, as you know, is the one making the claim is the one who holds the burden of proof. So if you're making a claim, uh, so you could frame it up such that if you're make, if I'm making a claim that I'm free in the libertarian sense and you're making a claim that determinism is true, well, then in, in that case, we're both making a claim. But um, if but but it really does seem like, and I, I know that I have Calvinist friends who argue against this, but I think it really is does seem intuitive to us that we have libertarian freedom. And of course, in the clip you're going to play, not to not to spoil the lead, but um, uh, Piper admits that very thing that he, that it was intuitive to him that he had libertarian freedom. So I, I think I think we have this intuition that people have libertarian freedom, that we have libertarian freedom. So in that sense, I think the burden of proof is pretty strongly on the side of the person who says all your intuitions are wrong about that. And whatever you ended up doing, you really couldn't have done otherwise. Right. And just to be clear, um, like we said before, um, there are Sometimes Calvinists have the same vocabulary, different dictionary, defining of terms. When when John Piper specifically talks about libertarian free will, he really doesn't use those terms very often. Um, he's, he, ca he calls it ulti ultimate self-determination is what he calls libertarian free will. And, uh, for example, in this article that um, that I had pulled up, this is what John Piper says. And I'm just the reason I'm doing this is to give you some uh it's kind of come some information before we listen to John Piper talk. So, you know, where he's coming from. Uh, he says this, God is the only being who is ultimately self-determining. So he seems to be actually be arguing here that, that God does have libertarian free will, which is something that some Calvinists aren't willing to admit, because if you can show that free will, libertarian free will exists, then it's not irrational to, to, to make the claim that he could create creatures with some level of libertarian free will. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm glad that you bring that up because this is one of the ways this also comes up in my discussions with atheists and that and it was really a blessing when I realized this and I'm not the first to say it. Um, but uh, if it, 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 God as the creator of the universe is the creator of time, space and physical matter. And so if you're if, if God if sands the physical universe without the physical universe, God exists spacelessly and timelessly and without material things, then whatever happens when God creates, it has to be a libertarianly free choice because there's nothing, there's nothing determining God. If there's no physical universe or time for determination to work on him, there's nothing determining God to create. And there's no randomness happening in a spaceless time. Mm -hmm. day. And so for that reason, God's choice to create the universe must be libertarianly free, at least in the sense that nothing external to God is determining what God does. And uh, if Calvinists want to call that compatibilism, it's not. We could go into that, but it's not compatibilism. The bottom line is I'm happy to defend with any Calvinist the claim that God must have libertarian freedom. And so if there's a Calvinist out there who says, well, libertarian freedom in principle isn't even possible. Well, then you're going to have problems with God's creation of the universe. So I agree with you. If we have at least one being, namely God, who has libertarian freedom, then there's nothing incoherent about the notion that God could create beings with libertarian freedom. Well said. Uh, Brent, uh, Britton Stanfield, one of our resident Calvinists, kind of quasi-Calvinist, I would say, actually, uh, he says, there's nothing intuitive about libertarian free will to me. I do what I want to do all the time. My choices are determined by what I want. What would you say to him? Well, yeah, I, I think... Uh, I've, I've had Calvinists say this back to me. In fact, our friend Chris Tate has said this to me uh, in person several times that actually what is intuitive is what Brenton says here. It's intuitive that I can, that whatever I do is what I wanted to do, right? Because that's the thing. You do whatever you want. You just can't want whatever you want, as Jerry Wall says. So, um, but, and, and Chris Tate likens it to a character in a story. You know, if we could imagine a character in a, in a written novel having, um, a self-awareness, which they don't, he says, well, they would, they would, uh, they would intuit that they do whatever they want, but what they don't know is they're doing whatever the author of the story wrote them to do. And my first response to Chris is, 
We don't know what a fictional character would intuit about themselves because we can't <laughs> ask them because they're fictional characters. Uh, right. Secondly, I, I don't actually think that I, I can't tell Brenton what he intuits about himself, but I don't think that's true for most people because right. whenever you do something that is boneheadedly stupid, your first response is I, I wouldn't, I shouldn't have done that. If I had it to do over, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't do that. That was the wrong thing to do. And throughout all of that is the theme of, I could have done something other than that. Why did I do that? Right. And, and I've always pointed back to the fact that if your desires are determining your choices, then you're just an instinctive being who's acting upon instinctive reflexes, not actual moral choices. So we have several wants in, laid out in front of us, desires that we can choose to act to fulfill. So I can act to fulfill this desire over that desire. Um, it, 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 we're not intuitive creatures that just instinctively, you know, act to, to do what we were created by our creator to do. And so when you, when he says that something like my choices are determined by what I want, then you just take it a step back. Who determines what you want at any given time and, and place? Well, God does on Calvinism. And so ultimately that's just plain old determinism. Um, it's just God has de ultimately determined what you want so that you will act uh, instinctively, I would say, upon what God has caused you to want in those given circumstances, which he also meticulously, providentially uh, mac micromanages according to the Calvinistic perspective. And so that's where we would push back on that. But nevertheless, here, here's what uh, John Piper says. God is the only being who has libertarian free will. He, is, he, he uses the term ultimately self-determining and is himself ultimately the disposer of all things, including all choices. So he's the disposer of all choices. Our choices, Satan's choices, the molester's choices, every choice. God is the disposer of all choices. However many or diverse other intervening causes are, on this definition, no human being has free will at any time. Okay, So no human being has free will, but God has free will, according to the way he's defined it at any time, neither before or after the fall or in heaven. So even Adam and Eve did not have free will as being a, a libertarian free will could have done otherwise, which seems to fly in the face of what the Westminster and the London Baptist Confession of Faith says uh, in, in their chapters nine on free will. Both points one and two seem to indicate that Adam and Eve were not determined uh, by anything outside themselves to choose one way or the other. And in other books, Piper appeals to mystery. So I, I'm not sure how that fits because it seems to me he would say that jo that uh, Adam and Eve chose to sin because God decreed for them to choose to sin. Uh, he is the decisive cause of that that choice. It seems to me that would be the only way for him to, to land. And so um, before or after the fall in heaven, are creatures ultimately self-determining. There are great measures of self-determination as the Bible often shows but never is man the ultimate or decisive cause of his preferences and choices. So man is not the decisive cause of his preferences and choices. Who is then? Well, God would have to be the decisive cause of men's preferences and choices. So if you prefer uh, same-sex attraction, then that God is the decisive cause of that. If you prefer to molest, kill, rape, still destroy, then God is the cause of that. It seems that would be the, the conclusion of this worldview. And this is why we, we push back so vehemently against it, because it, it really does undermine the goodness, the character, the holiness of God in our estimation. So when man's agency and God's agency are compared, both are real. I don't know what that means exactly. Both are real. Um, what does he mean by real? I, I don't, he doesn't really define what he means by real. Well, what he means God, by that is we're really making choices. It's just really determined by God. I, I, yeah, I guess, which means they're not real as far as we're concerned because they're not real choices. Because what is a choice? A choice is a selection between available options. And we're not making a selection between available options, so it's not real. We are intuitively, I mean, we are instinctively doing what God has reflexively caused us to want to do in any given circumstance. Um, so, uh, but God's is our, but God's is decisive. Yet here's the mystery that causes so many to stumble. God is always decisive in such a way that man's agency is real. Again, there's that word and his responsibility remains. In other words, God determines what you will decide to do, but yet you are still held accountable or responsible for what he decided for you to do. And this is the mystery that, uh, that John Piper ultimately appeals to with regard to, to this particular point. Um, so that, that kind of gives us understanding at least of what John Piper's 
uh, position is on what free will is. He doesn't believe we actually have free will in, in that sense, that we ultimately are the decisive cause of the decisions and choices we make, but that ultimately God is the decisive cause of the decisions and choices we, we make. And so with that, let's listen to this clip and then uh, Dr. Hunter will let you reply. As we, let's turn to the book and let's think through, um, throughout the book, you return again and again to the issue of assumptions. Okay, this is a major thing. You, you can't read through this book and not pick up. John Piper thinks a lot about our assumptions um, and how they influence the way that we read the Bible. So help us understand two things. One, why is it so important to be aware of our assumptions? And two, why and how should we test them by the scriptures rather than impose them on the scriptures. What, right. what, what? Okay, so just just to highlight what the question is, uh, he's talking about our assumptions. This is what we are re being referring to as our what we believe intuitively. In other words, uh, there's a lot of quotes from Calvinists out there that that we all naturally are Arminians. I've heard them say that we're all natural Pelagians. I've even heard that in the more derogatory way of saying it. Uh, and this is ultimately what he gets is getting to. Well, wait a minute that, before you go, go on. Are you saying that in other written stuff, Piper says what he says here, but explicitly says that he thinks everyone is naturally inclined to believe they have, that they're Arminians, like basically that we have libertarian freedom? I, I hesitate to say I've heard Piper say it in specific because I can't recall for sure if it was exactly John Piper, but I know I've heard other Calvinists say yeah. it. Um, and, and, and I know you probably have as well. Um, I've, I've heard him use the term Pelagian. Uh, matter of fact, I'm, I'm almost 99% sure it was R.C. Sproul who said we are naturally all Pelagian. In other words, we're kind of born Pelagians. Meaning, yeah. well, we're, in his mind, we're born intuitively believing we have the capacity to make our own free choices. Well, I think that's uh, important to know that because, you know, um, for individuals in the audience who might think along the lines of our friend Chris Date and colleague Chris Date that, um, well, no, what's intuitive is not the uh, libertarian freedom, but just that you have, that, that you do whatever you want, that compatibilism is basically true. Um, for those that would think that way, it, it's relevant to note that even if you don't think you have that intuition, many Calvinists do think they have uh, that intuition um, or started with that intuition. And uh, so I, I think that's, I think that's a relevant point. However, as we move on, I think we'll see another intuition that we do all share that does that isn't directly libertarian free will. That that I I simply won't believe anyone who tells me this isn't their intuition. But we'll just save that for later. Gotcha. All right, we continue on. What are assumptions doing, and why do they matter for us? Yeah. Well, it might help instead of speaking in generalities to give an example. Okay. Um, the reason they're important to state a generality is that we tend to see things in the light of our assumptions and interpret them to fit our assumptions. Okay. We bring, all of us do this, it's not pointing a finger at anybody, it's just all of us bring life experiences and conceptions of reality to what we experience in and outside books in the Bible, and we tend to see what we see in connection with those assumptions, and that can give a meaning which might be helpful, uh -huh. if it's a true assumption, or hurtful, harmful, misleading, if it's a wrong assumption. So okay, so he's saying something I think you and I would agree with here, that we all do have assumptions that we bring to the text. Um, yeah. I, I've always said, I think a good assumption that we can bring to the text is God's character is good, and he's right, and he's holy. Right. And therefore, however you read the Bible, you should never come to the conclusion that he would do something immoral and wrong, uh, and, and intuitively immoral and wrong, and therefore you should do a, a better job at, at, at hermeneutics. For example, when the Bible says something like what we've talked about, figures of speech like the White House put Iraq into shambles, doesn't literally mean Barack Obama went over and started cutting off heads and burning down buildings in Iraq, but that he removed his troops, the, the American troops, so that Iraq could do its own free uh, will. Uh, and the, the bad players there in Iraq did all those horrible things simply because we removed our power that was keeping order. In the same way, God can remove his hand of protection. He can allow people to autonomously act freely. And sometimes uh, the scriptures will use vernacular that seems to blame God. God uh, did this thing or God uh, made this to happen, but it's actually a figure of speech, meaning he removed his hand of protection so that people would act freely. Um and that's what good that's what good apologists do all the time is they they answer the the 
the opposition from the atheist that says God's character is flawed. Uh, God's not a God in the Bible that's worth worshiping because look at how bad he is. Good apologists like you all the time are going through and explaining these kinds of figures of speech throughout the scripture and why we should maintain. No, God is good. Uh, his character is right. It's holy. It's good. What would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. So, so commenting on this, to set this up in a way that hopefully it will summarize what we've said so far and put forward what we see as problematic about this. Um, a good argument for something will have premises that are plausible, which means more likely to be true than false. So for those that may not be uh, aware of how syllogisms and arguments work, if you have something like God made all planets, or that's, that's premise one. Premise two, earth is a planet. Conclusion, therefore God made earth. Okay, that should be something that we can all agree on, right? Well, both of those things are plausible. They're more likely to be true than false. That if it's a planet, God made it. Earth is a planet. Therefore, God made Earth. Okay, so whenever we're talking about the go back to your thing that I know that I exist, my belief that I exist, what would you ever do? What evidence could you bring to convince me that I, Braxton Hunter, actually don't exist? Now, you could maybe convince someone else that Braxton Hunter does not exist, but me, myself, how are you going to convince me that I don't exist? What data, what evidence, what argument, any argument, and this is the key, this is very important, any argument brought to show me that I don't exist is going to have premises like that that are less likely to be true than my immediate experience that I am true, that I do exist. And so it's going to, it's, it's, it's going to fail. That's like the greatest intuition I could possibly have is that I exist, right? Well, um, the, or at least the most obvious, not the greatest in importance, but the most obvious. Okay, so when it comes to my libertarian freedom or morality, those kind of things, that, that there are really good and bad things, right and wrong things, or that I really can choose to do other than whatever I ended up doing, that is not as strong, perhaps, as my belief that I exist, but it's so incredibly strong. It is incredibly strong, such that any argument you burnt that John Piper wants to bring to show that I don't have libertarian freedom is going to have to have premises that are more likely to be true than my own immediate intuition that I do have free will. Now, since Piper and you and I and many of our listeners are all Bible believing Christians who, who believe in the authority of Scripture, he could do that by bringing, bringing Bible verses. The bad news for Piper is that as you demonstrate every week on this show, Leighton, multiple times a week, is, is that the Bible doesn't, isn't best explained that way. It, it, doesn't, it, it isn't best explained on Calvinist interpretations, we would say. It's best explained on, on libertarian uh, interpretations, at least much of the time, most of the time. So he doesn't have Scripture to go to to, to turn that around. And our intuition is so incredibly strong that, um, th that, it's, that it's problematic. But um, th there's another thing I want to say on this that's related. Even if, say, Brenton or whoever it was, yeah, Brenton, Stanfield, and others in the chat would say, well, I don't have that intuition that I have libertarian freedom. I just have intuition that, that whatever I do is what I wanted to do. And that still can be determinism like Piper wants. Okay, but let me ask you this. And this is where you've really got to be honest with yourself and look in the mirror and ask yourself what you really believe and not what your position demands. Do you not have an extremely strong intuition that uh, to punish someone for doing what they were determined to do unchangeably, that that is uh, wrong, that that is not a good thing. Is it not an intuition to you that when I say God determined, uh, God determined that uh, this particular man would rape and murder a child, he commanded the man not to rape and murder the child through secondary scriptures and things like that. The man does what God unchangeably determined that he must do. And then, uh, and then punishes him for that, even though it was what he determined right. him to do, but told him not to do. If you, if there is not something inside of you that says no, that is not justice. Um, if someone wants to say that, I'm not. I'm just not sure I believe them. Now they can say, yeah, I have that intuition, but um, God's God, and there's you know scripture to consider and all that. Okay, that's fine. We can talk about that. But if someone won't at least admit that they have that intuition that that strikes against justice. I'm just not sure I can believe them. Yeah. And, 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 and I want you to hear what Piper says with regard to this. I'm glad that you made the argument 
before you hear what he's about to say, because what you're hearing him about to say now is, is ultimately we do intuitively believe we assume that it is wrong to hold people accountable for something they don't have any control over. Uh, and then, and then he, he attempts to make the argument that that's not what the Bible teaches. So listen. That's why they're so important. They're, they tend to be controlling. For example, I mean, the reason it shows up probably so often is that the assumption that one must have free will, meaning self-determination, I would even say ultimate self-determination, one must have that in order to be held accountable before God is an assumption that I think millions of people bring to the Bible, which I don't share. I did once. Uh -huh. I assumed once that if I'm not decisively and ultimately the one, say, who at the moment of my conversion cast the deciding vote, I can't be held accountable. I'm a robot. Okay, so he's confessing what we were talking about earlier, that millions of people come to this assumption, including himself. And I, I can't help but wonder, why do millions of us naturally, if you will, intuitively come to this assumption, if not by the decree of God? In other words, God decreed for us millions of people to have this assumption for some reason, only to change some people by determinative means to not believe that assumption. Go figure. Right. And did you, is that the end of that clip that you have? No, no, no. We're, we're, we've got more. Do you want well, me to keep going? That is, I thought it was interesting that you clipped it off right there because he does something clever. No, no, no. That's not true. That, that implies intent. I don't think he intended it this way. I think he's just used to talking this way. But he, he talks about, you know, he makes the point that he just made, which is that he used to share that assumption. He's saying assumption. I don't think well, that's. You want to keep going? You want to keep it listening to the end of it before you? Before yeah, you comment yeah, on what he said. The okay. next point, that, the next thing right. that he said. Here it goes. You can't find that assumption in the Bible. Hmm. So that gets to your second question. Right. All right. If I, I, I've got to say this real quick. You can't find that assumption in the Bible. I also can't find the assumption that I exist in the Bible. Yeah. You know, I, I can't I can't find um a, a lot of things in the Bible that are intuitively known to be right or wrong. Um but there, there are a lot of passages which seem to presume that assumption. I mean, every, every command, every time he acts, every time God acts like he's upset at us, yes. <laughs> it seems that seems intuitive. Like, why would you be upset at me for doing what you determined for me to do? Right. And, and this is not the point I was about to make, but, but I, because there's still something coming, but I, I want to say again, he is softening up the criticism of his position. I don't think intentionally, by using the word assumption and saying assuming things rather than intuition, because there is a relevant difference. I might have seen Jonathan walk down the hall and then I look down the hall and I don't see him anymore. And so I assume that he went into the restroom when in reality he might've gone to his office, right? Okay. Right. That's an assumption, but I don't have some deep intuition about which room of the building Jonathan's in. Right. That's a good point. So I, I, I can assume making it, bringing your assumptions to the Bible. Okay. Yeah, we can all do that and, and we can be wrong and we can be wrong about our intuitions too, but intuitions are much deeper and much stronger. I don't assume I exist. I do intuit that I exist. I, I mean, it's true that I assume that I exist, but it's deeper than that. It's an intuition. And I think those two things are important to bring out, but uh, that's not quite what I wanted to get at. So yeah, let him roll. All right. We'll, we'll keep going. Is that a true or a false assumption? Yeah. One must have, ultimate self-determination in order to be held accountable before God for the things that you do by your will. Is that true? And my approach is I want to, as best I can, test my assumptions by texts that push back. Right. I mean, some texts easily fit two assumptions, uh -huh. go either way. Well, that's no help inciting which assumption. The texts that you have to come to terms with most are the texts that clearly say that assumption's right or that can't be right in view of this. Uh -huh. And that takes... Okay. Go I'm ahead. not... 
I'm not sure where it is, but 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 he he said a moment ago, and and you see this often. Now, John Piper has been clear. I've got a quote for him in my Problem of Evil short video on the Problem of Evil um, on my website in the short videos playlist. But I've got a quote from him where he talks about God determines um, every you know the song the bird sings, the every blade of grass. I mean, it's the movement of every molecule. God determines everything, right? That's that, and, and like he says, there's no free will. But there he says. He, he he says he he uh, he focuses it down to the point of your conversion, which of course divine determinists, Calvinists, are do think that God is the determining factor in your salvation. It's just that that's not to say God is also on Calvinism, or at least on John Piper's brand of Calvinism, the determiner of everything that happens, and that yeah. is an important thing. Now, with his intuition about uh, justice uh, or about God punishing people for what he determines that they will do. Isn't that what he said he has an intuition about? I, you know, that, right. I mean, yeah, you have that intuition. That's the thing I'm saying. If someone says they don't have that intuition, I just don't believe them that, that you don't have the intuition that it is unjust to, uh, to create someone determining that they will rape and murder, command them not to rape and murder determine they do rape and murder and then hold them accountable for doing what you told them not to do, but determine that they would do. If you say that that makes sense to you, that that is not, that there's not an intuition that's wrong. I just don't believe you. Again, you can say something like, yeah, but our intuitions can be wrong. And I'm going to give you biblical data that shows that your intuition about that is wrong. Fair enough. And good luck with that. Cause I don't think you can, but, but fair enough. But if you tell me you don't have that intuition, I'm just, I'm not buying it. But what I wanted to point out there was the, the the shift that goes back and forth sometimes between speaking as though what's determined is your salvation without, you know, making it clear that everything, including your salvation, is determined. Yeah, uh, I, I was just putting in uh, to the bottom here uh, this quote from John Calvin, all future things being uncertain to us, we hold them in suspense as though they might happen either one way or another. Uh, and the reason I put that is because, and he even has another quote, um, I, I didn't have time to enter this one in, but he goes on to say, hence, as to future time, because the issue of all things is hidden from us, each ought to do, do so apply himself to his office as though nothing were determined about any part. In other words, believe determinism, but you have to live as if you're not determined. You have to live as if it's in suspense and it could happen either way. In other words, live intuitively what you believe to be right, but believe differently than what you intuitely believe. Does, is, right. is that you, know, what you hear as well? The 21st century atheist, late atheist, uh, Christopher Hitchens said it much more succinctly than John Calvin did. He said, I, of course I have free will. I'm forced to, I can't help it. You know, I'm determined to have free will, in other words. And the point was intentionally tongue in cheek. He doesn't believe you have free will, but he's forced to act as though he has free will. Right. That's the point yeah. that Calvin's making. And it's, of course, the only way you can live your life. And that's a problem. When we do worldview analysis, you're, a good worldview is one that is livable, which means every day you yeah. live as though the statements of your worldview are true. Well, you and you when you're a, when you're a determinist, you have to live as though you're free, even though you're not now. Uh, in their defense, compatibilists come back, come back and say, no, I can live as though I do whatever I want to do. Yes, but you you do function and you hold other people responsible and you feel responsible for the things that you do as if you could have done anything else. And that's right. that strikes out the livability of Calvinism. Which which is what this, uh, thank you, Jesus, uh, is the name of his moniker there. So he says, uh, so then Calvinism is useless. Um, and that's kind of gets to the point is it's not practically tenable. So it's not, it's not really serving a practical purpose. At least theistic determinism isn't as far as I can tell, because you're ultimately telling people, um, uh, what, what you intuitively believe is true about your choices. Isn't really true about your choices, but knowing that is not really helpful to you. And it, and it's actually harmful as we've demonstrated in other episodes for some people, it may not be harmful for everybody, but because some people are able to have the cognitive dissonance, be able to live as if free will is true while believing it's not, but some people aren't able to live that way. Some people actually become fatalistic in their behaviors and actions and, and even maybe even atheistic, uh, in their actions, as we've heard with Derek Webb and Megan Phelps and others who, uh, Calvinism had a very negative effect on them. My own testimony too, with my sinful behaviors, 
uh, and, and punning to the decree of God as the reasons for my sinful desires and behaviors, that that was a negative impact that it had on my healing and for me personally. And so um, you, you can't you can't argue with the fact that that happens uh, it, because it's happened. Um, and therefore, the only explanation for for that is that God's determined for that to happen. And and if Calvinism is true, uh, and what seems more intuitive to me is that Calvinism Calvinism is just false, and therefore uh, the 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 bad behavior is coming from a false belief, not the not the actual truth. Yeah, and um, and, and, and and it's important to state here, at least for me, and I think this is true of you, Leighton, is even though even though I have this deep intuition that I have free will and that what the Calvinist is describing strikes against justice and strikes against what I understand about God's nature. If scripture, if I was convinced that scripture demonstrated what the Calvinist is saying, I would, I would accept it because I'm a, I believe in biblical authority. It's just that I don't think the Bible teaches that and that the Bible doesn't teach that in my estimation and yours fits very well with the fact that it really looks like God built me to think about it this way. Yeah, well said. Uh, I want to continue with the clip here and let him have full hearing on this portion at least. Really serious humility, because you might be wrong and you have to come to terms with your error yeah. or your fallibility. And it takes, I think, significant give and take with other people who see things differently from you. I remember when I was in college and... Um, some of your writings actually led me to question a number of my assumptions. And the method that I settled upon, I don't know why, prov providence, probably, uh, for no trying probably. to... No, probably. No, probably. Okay, so I, I wanted to get that in there, at least that portion of it, because notice notice he even kind of says, well, I, I, why I came to this conclusion, well, providence, maybe. And that he says, no, probably. It, it, it definitely happened that way. And th this, this comes to the point that I always make, that the reason people adopt determinism, i.e. Calvinism, on Calvinism is because God in his providence has caused them to. Thus, the other must be true that Braxton and Hunter and Leighton Flowers and millions of millions of other Christians throughout human history have rejected Calvinistic determinism because God has so decreed it. You can't get around that fact. And, and I think that's a huge blight on the Calvinistic worldview, whether they accept it or believe it or not. That seems to be one of the largest issues and, and problems with holding to Calvinism is why are there so few Christians, relatively speaking, who become Calvinistic in the deterministic sense of the word like John Piper, if it's true, except that for whatever reason, God decrees most of his children not to believe in something that he sees as a vital truth, of a, a core doctrine of Christianity. I don't know how they deal with that. What do you think? No, I agree 100 percent. And what's um, sad about that is when I've seen and, and you've had people on your show like this, I've got friends who have done this who are Calvinists, but who will go on an atheist YouTube channel or something uh, or in private conversation. And the atheist says, well, look, if you're a Calvinist, um, then uh, isn't the reason that I'm not a Christian right now and that I don't believe a thing you're saying, isn't it because God just hasn't elected me and and uh, irresistibly graced me and, and all those sorts of things? And the Calvinist has to answer, well, yeah. And the Calvin, and then the, the atheist will say, well, then why, why are you even talking to me about this? And the Calvinist will rightly say um, from their perspective, well, it, it could be that by my sharing the gospel with you right now, that that will be the means that God uses to irresistibly grace you and, and all those sorts of things. But if it doesn't happen, if in the end of the day, the atheist just says, well, I, I don't think I'm elect. I'm not experiencing that. I don't have any inclination to believe. I mean, that's, that's, that. that that's yeah. what's going on. In other and, words, and I can't understand. Yeah. Well, and I can't understand how that's not the perfect excuse in the world. Being born without the capacity to believe seems like the perfect excuse for not believing. Yeah. I, I, I can't matter of fact, if I tried to think of a better excuse, in other words, try to imagine with me a better excuse than what the Calvinistic system offers to unbelievers. I can't think of a better excuse than I do not have as a human being the capacity to believe the gospel. I, do, I don't have that capacity. Um, is there a better excuse? I mean, I'm asking you, Brex, and I'm just, I'm not, I didn't no, prepare I you for this. I'm, I'm thinking, can you think, uh, like if you had to come up with a better excuse that was rational, that was real 
Can you think of a better excuse in the world than I was born without the capacity to believe the gospel for your reason for not believing the gospel? No. And, and of course, this gets back to the same old issue that I'm saying is intuitively obvious that Calvinists, like John Piper apparently, have to walk away from. And that is that in passages like um, Romans chapter 1, verse 20, where it says the invisible things of God's eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen through what has been made so that they are without excuse. He's talking about idolaters there, but he's talking about people who don't accept the truth about one creator, God. Now, whatever you want to say about Christianity specifically there, he's saying that if you don't recognize there's one maker God who made everything because of looking around at creation, you don't have an excuse for that. But if determinism is true and someone doesn't believe that, that there's a God, um, they have a darn good excuse. The example that I've given in your presence late and before is if I tell my, I, I don't have a five-year-old daughter anymore, but, but when I did, if I tell my five-year-old daughter to pick up her doll and take it to her bedroom and she doesn't do it, well, then she's got no excuse. She does not have a good excuse because that doll probably weighs a half a pound. But if I tell my five-year-old daughter to pick up the couch with me laying on it and carry that to her bedroom and she doesn't do it, she's got a darn good excuse. It literally wasn't possible for her to do any such thing. And when we look at Romans 1 20 and we say, OK, um, if someone doesn't believe that there's one maker God because they were determined not to believe that there's one maker God, then it seems like they've got a darn good excuse. It seems they're like they're more like my daughter not picking up me, the couch with me laying on it and taking it to her bedroom because she literally couldn't. And they literally right, couldn't right. because they were determined not to. Well, here, here's a good example of a fallacy from Britain uh, as a Calvinist here. He says, there is no excuse. Excuses get us out of consequences. If God has it's not saved you, then you will not be saved. You have you don't escape the consequences. That's the point, <laughs> Brenton, is, okay, uh, suppose Braxton said to his daughter, pick me up, pick the couch up, carry me up the stairs. And when she can't do it, he gets up and beats her. Okay, that you're, you're confusing the consequences with the excuse. The excuse is actually a good excuse, a very good excuse for not actually her doing the thing that she's told to do. It's a really good excuse. It's a correct excuse. In other words, it's not like my dog ate my homework when that really didn't happen. That's, that's a, that's a false excuse. This is actual, a real excuse and it's valid. I can't daddy. I can't pick you up. You're, you're, that's beyond my capacity as your child. I can't do that. That's a good excuse. And then, and then Braxton saying, Nope, I'm not going to let you have that excuse, even though it's valid, even though it's correct, even though you're right. And I'm going to beat you now. That is intuitively, we all know that intuitively Braxton is a bad father if he were to do something like that. We all intuitively know that's true. Even if, and even to, to lighten the load a little bit, even if I just told her to go stand in the corner as punishment, that would be unjust too. Or if I spanked her, that would be unjust. Or if I didn't right. let it her have to be a dinner. beating, right. It doesn't have to be a beating for it to be unjust. Yeah. Any right. punishment for that would be unjust and intuitively. With, you know, I, I want to make it clear. I'm not challenging the truth of, of Romans chapter one, verse 20. I'm upholding what I think is the truth of Romans 1 20. I'm saying God says those people that don't believe in one maker, God don't have a good excuse because they have the available evidence of, rev of general revelation all around them, the created world and all those kinds of things. So what I'm saying here is if that's true, that they don't have an excuse and the creation should evidence the maker God to them, then they can believe is what that, that, that seems to teach. And, um, and, and yeah, that's based on our intuition that, uh, that, you, that you have to be response able as Leighton says, uh, but, but, um, I still yet have yet seen any evidence to strike against that extremely powerful intuition. Okay. I've got to, I've got to reply to Trevor real quick. He keeps, he, we keep using, uh, stories of children and we're not, you know, lost people aren't God's children. Okay. If a next door neighbor walked into Braxton's house and he said to pick up me off my couch and if you don't, I'm going to punish you. Okay. Does that, be, is that better? Okay. It's not, it's his next door neighbor. Either way, it's still, you're, it's wrong for you to punish the next door neighbor's kid. If they come over to your house, all right. So I, I, I don't know. Sometimes or, people or pick uh, analogies. It, let's amp it up a little bit. Let's say the president of the United States calls me to the White House lawn and says, "Rip that tree, that big mighty oak tree, out of the ground and throw it across the United States." And I don't do it. And he says, "You've got no excuse for not doing it." And I say, "I can barely lift fifty pounds because I'm weak." Um, and you want me to rip this oak tree out of the ground? I can't, it's not within my capacity to do that. 
Well, you know what? Um, that's too bad for you because I told you to do it. And even if you couldn't do it, I'm still holding you responsible. And anyone okay. out here who challenges that, like here, here's where I want to like, I know you do this every, every week, Layton, but for me, I've been out of the Calvinism game for a little bit and I come back into it and I look at this and I think, it's not that I think that you're irrational. And I actually admire about my Calvinist brothers that they're taking the Bible so seriously. I, I but, but I have to look at that and say, you got to at least give me what Piper's giving me here. At least Piper is giving me, yeah, that seems right. That's that's the intuition. That seems to make sense. Yeah. It's just not what the it, Bible teaches. It just doesn't seem honest, in other words, for somebody to say, no, that's not really what we intuit. That's right, really not right. what we, you know, automatically. He, he at least is is honest, intellectually honest enough to come out and say, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, we really do intuit that. We do believe that. Um, Britain is making another uh, stab at this. Uh, Braxton is, is not uh, his daughter's cr creator. He doesn't set the rules for her. Either God makes us his image bearer or he doesn't. If he doesn't, it isn't an excuse. So in other words, he's appealing to the fact that that analogy doesn't work because you haven't created your daughter in the way that God creates us. Um, how would you respond to that? Well, he's attacking the analogy instead of the point of the analogy. The point of the analogy has to do with the nature of justice. Now, it is true that whoever the authority figure, the, the difference in authority figure does make a difference in some cases. I fail to see how this is one of the cases where who the authority figure is, because we're talking about if I can't look at God and say, OK, he, God is talking to me about justice. God is talking to me about love. So I look at God and I say he's telling me that he's loving, that he's ultimate justice. If I look at God and my sense of justice is completely the opposite of what he's doing, then it, it, it is senseless to even use justice as a term to describe it. You just say God is God. Justice, whatever God does, well, God is God because the sense of what justice means to anyone is is, is very clear, and and this is um, uh, to go against that justice. Well, also to put it in the realm of things that we can't respond to, which is to say, well, because it's God, the rule, everything's all the rules are different, and and yeah. you know, yeah. Well, and that's what I the way that I always point out the nitpicking of analogies is I just give I just grant them that point. Okay, so let's pretend like Braxton has the ability to create senient beings. So let's just say for the sake of so that's what's great about suppositional arguments. You can suppose anything. So let's suppose that Braxton now has the ability to create gir little girls. Okay. So he creates a little girl, okay? Not the and best he girl. created her for you know, I, I know it's, it's an analogy, so you can do whatever you want, suppositional. So let's suppose he creates a little girl and then tells her to do something that she's incapable of doing and then punishes her for doing it. Same, this, the analogy works exactly the same. If he creates her as a sentient being with feelings that actually feels pain and then causes her pain for doing something that she absolutely has no control over, all of us intuitively know that's not a very just creator. That That's just wrong. And this goes back to the the the, the point I think C.S. Lewis makes in that quote that we use. I use it in my book, and I use it so often that if our black is his white, our good is his bad, and our bad is his good, then we can say he is no. We know not what that he he right. might as well be an omnipotent yeah. fiend, an all powerful demon, because I mean there there's no there's no measure by which we can call him good and therefore worship him if his good is our bad and our bad is his good. Yeah, that's that's the point I'm making that you made it so much more eloquently. And another thing that this leads to is you want to be careful with saying, well, since he's God, then anything he does is just because then you've got to ask yourself, well, is there anything God could do then in your mind that would be unjust? Because not that he would do it, but that if he did it would be unjust because you can land in what's called philosophical voluntarism, which is what Islam teaches. And in Islam, then God can be a uh, haughty one minute and then he can be you know, merciful the next and vengeful the next. And um, it, 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 what the nature yeah. of God changes day by day, because whatever God does just becomes good. You want to get away from that voluntarism that says, see, when when people challenge uh, when when Christians bring an argument for morality, uh, that God exists because of, you know, like the moral argument. C.S. Lewis brought a moral argument in mere Christianity. The challenge is called the Euthyphro Dilemma from Plato, and Socrates gave the, it was presented the Euthyphro Dilemma, which is the idea that are, God, are things good because God likes them? In other words, uh, they become good because God likes them, 
and they wouldn't have been good otherwise, but because God likes them, they become good. Or does God like the things that are good? Like there's some goodness over above God that he appeals to. And atheists, many atheists think these are the only two options. Either God determines what's good by just liking things and they become good, or God's appealing to something over and above himself that's good. When the reality is, no, the nature of God is good. God, goodness is a part of God's nature. And what this means is God will never do anything that's unjust, but there are right. unjust things that gods could do, in other words. And so it's not that, yeah, God can do whatever he wants, and that's just just because that's what God does. No, as you say, and as C.S. Lewis says, we understand justice, and we understand that God's nature is just. Right. Well, it's, it's like that TikTok video that's going everywhere right, viral right now with that young guy right with his camera in the face of his camera, and he's talking about Jesus being a bigot. Uh, are, are being a racist or something of that nature because he calls he refers to some kind of a, a woman as a dog or something like that. I can't remember the exact thing he was saying, but he pretty much concludes uh, Jesus was a bigot. And then he, and he, then he apologized and repents for his bigotry is, is basically his claim. Now, a good apologist like you and I would, would bring argument and say, well, he's misunderstanding the context and the quote. And we would explain why Jesus isn't a bigot. He isn't a racist. And he, he didn't repent of being a bigot or a racist. And we would explain it that way. It seems like what, what the, the philosophy of this approach might be is to say, well, okay, he is a racist, it seems, but we're not going to hold him accountable for racism because he's God. And so it's okay for God to be a racist. And, right. and you can't question because God is separate from us and God's different from us. So you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't blame God for being a racist and that being bad because for God, he doesn't have the same standard as we do. And therefore, yes, it's true that what he did there was racist, but we can't hold him accountable for racism because God did it. And, yeah. and there's that's the two different approaches. It, it's ultimately saying, no, we're saying God's not a racist. No, Jesus isn't being racist there because you misunderstand the context of the scriptures. And so you've, you've misinterpreted the scripture to come to the conclusion that God's character is flawed, i.e. he's a racist. And what and what s seems like the other approach is, is just, just to accept this bad seemingly bad characteristic of God and then explain it away by saying, but it's God. So it's okay. Right. Right. That, that, that's not appropriate. All right. Let, let, let me continue with this clip just because we want to get through this entire portion of this clip. Let's listen. Uh, for, for trying to, I, I very question. much want to be biblical rather than systematic. If I have to give up one, right. In other words, if I, I but I didn't say logical. Right. <laughs> we could go there. I mean, I'm accused of being illogical. Right. And I reject that. I believe logic is God's creation. I mean, yep. it reflects God. Yep. He, he's, he, he doesn't commit the law of non-contradiction. He doesn't break that law. Uh, things can't be A and not A at the same time in the same way. God is a logical being. I don't think in saying that God governs the will and my will is accountable is illogical. It doesn't break any logical laws. What do, you, what do you think about that? Well, first of all, I agree with him that explicit, there's no explicit contradiction there that to say that God determines everything and that we do what we want, but God determines what we want. So, so we, we make choices, but they're the choices that God determined. There's nothing explicitly contradictory there. Now, I do think that there's something implicitly contradictory in the nature of God, which is what we've just been d uh, discussing so far. But I also want to point to the interesting fact that he, uh, he, he intuits that the law of non-contradiction is true when he comes to the scripture. Why intuit that? Why into it the law of? Con I mean, of course, I believe that, but I'm not. I'm not into ditching our our intuitions, right? This is one of the most important metaphysical intuitions that we have: that A can't be A, and at the same sense, at the same time, not A, right? Right, and, and that's exactly the point: is that when we when we talk about the logical contradiction here, and, and a lot of Calvinists hold to just the logical contradiction. P Piper is at least this is one of the reasons Jerry Walls and other anti-Calvinist or other non-Calvinist who've spoken out against Calvinism have said that they really appreciate John Piper because John Piper doesn't commit the law of contradiction, non-contradiction, um, because he just comes right out and says, you don't have free will, uh, which we're about to hear in this, in this next clip. Matter of fact, let me, let me let you listen. So one way, one way I've tried to put this, um, like when I'm talking to our students here at Bethlehem is, um, a major task in theology is putting the mystery in the right place. Yeah, that's good. Um, and so, like you said, there's certain things. So, doctrine of the Trinity. Say, 
how is God three in one? How? How is God three in one? That he's three in one seems plain from text. How? We got all kinds of terms that we use to try to say the how, but there should be mystery there. How, how is Christ God and man? That's a mystery, hypostatic union. And then here, the intersection of creator and creature and how creator governs creature in a way that preserves creaturely integrity and responsibility. Those are the places where mysteries to be expected and not dismissed. Or if I can't explain how, then I don't affirm either side, but we should expect mystery in those places, right? Right, and, and getting it in the right place on this particular issue is challenging because people want to locate the mystery between, okay, I have free will and God is sovereign and I can't figure it out. And I say, that's not where the mystery lies. You don't have free will. Okay, and that's what I wanted to hear people people to hear him specifically say. You do not have libertarian free will. You do not have, you, you are not the decisive cause of your choices. Um, and, and that's how, he, in other words, he affirms determinism. That's what he means by sovereignty. He affirms determinism is true, sovereignty, he calls it. But you don't have free will. Some Calvinists want to have their cake and eat it too on this point. They want to try to maintain, yes, we have real free will. Even some of them will even come right out and say libertarian type of free will. Uh, Greg Hochul and other self-professing Calvinists, we do have libertarian free will, but yet determinism is true. Sovereignty under Calvinism is true. And that's just a mystery we cannot comprehend. And what Piper is pointing out, the same thing that he he writes an article against J.I. Packer for this, by the way, go back and read it. It's back in the seventies that he wrote it. He writes a, 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 an article against J.I. Packer for this very thing, because a lot of Calvinists are out there going, no, we have libertarian free will, but yet God is deterministically sovereign. And that's just the mystery that we have. And what Piper has recognized that many Calvinists have not is that is committing the law of non-contradiction. John MacArthur does this too. Yes. When he says these friends just get along, we, the brothers don't need to reconcile their, their friends. Mm -hmm. And he, and he, and he promotes the concept of libertarian free will. And then he, then he promotes the concept of determinism, i.e. sovereignty of God and Calvinism. And he says, these things are just mysterious and we can't get them. And what at least John Piper recognizes is those two things are contradictory and therefore, you cannot hold those two things and be a Christian without committing the law of non-contradiction. Yeah, fair assessment. J. I. Packer calls it an antinomy and says, right. Just "Don't worry about it. <laughs> you don't, don't think too much about it." But Piper's consistent on that. He had, the, what I've saw throughout this video. I watched three fourths of this video in prep, you know, since you asked me to come on, and um, it seems like his professor, the guy that's interviewing him, seems to. Uh, seems to be trying to say, well, well, wait a minute, you know, like the J.I. Packer thing, like you said, but, and, and throughout the rest of the video, he'll continually say, yeah, but we don't know how this happens. We know that is true. But we don't know how Piper is not the least bit confused about how he thinks this happens. How he thinks this happens is that God determines everything and then holds you responsible for what God determined. That's why he says that it disturbed him so much when he came to the conclusion that it was true. Which is what baffles me when we have other videos of Piper appealing to mystery as to why Adam and Eve sinned or appealing to mystery as to why Satan fell mm -hmm. um, and, and, and ultimately kind of guessing as to, to, to why he might have fallen when he's already told us exactly how right. and why God yeah. determines the person to do so for his own self-glorification. Why, why are you appealing to mystery on those two choices and not to all choices. And this is what we're trying to say. If you're going to appeal to mystery on Adam and Eve's choice or the mystery of the choice of Satan to fall, then why not appeal to that? Let that be the point where you place the mystery as he was, he was putting it to, to the, 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 the mystery of what a libertarian free choice is composed of and, and how it works. And just say, we don't know exactly how a creature makes a libertarian free choice, but we believe that he does. And that is beyond full comprehension, but we don't believe that God is the one who determines that choice. We believe that that choice is determined by the actor, the, the, the chooser, the determiner himself, and we leave the mystery there. We just stop right there. We say full stop. Braxton is responsible for Braxton's choices, period, end of discussion, stop. No, 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 other, no other thing needs to be said about that. Um, and instead of speculating beyond that to say, well, the reason that Braxton chose choice A instead of choice B is because God in his sovereign and unchangeable will 
predetermined for Braxton's desire to be such that he would only choose A instead of B, that 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 steps beyond that that concept of mystery and puts the mystery into a, a context where now Braxton's culpability is in question. Braxton's culpability or responsibility is in question as to whether Braxton's really responsible for his choice of, of A and, and rather rather than B, which is why we have this quandary that we talk about regularly on our program is this whole concept and idea of how in the world do those who end up in hell, who are ultimately there because God created them for hell, God did not really want them, God did not really desire for their salvation, and that that God um, did not ever really um, give them an opportunity to, to believe and to be saved, not that he owes anybody that opportunity, but what certainly seems to be revealed in Christ is that God desires the salvation of all, that he lays down his life for all of his enemies, that he's self-sacrificially loving towards his enemies, and therefore the character of God is displayed at least through Christ as one whose glory is displayed in his sacrifice for his enemies, not his control over his enemies' choices and decisions. What say you? Yeah, I agree. And um, it, this brings us back around to, uh, maybe, and I, you didn't put this up on the screen, but Brenton Sanfield says, we don't understand justice. Most things, most think that if God is not good to us, then he is unjust. We misunderstand justice because we think we are good. A good God would be good to us. No, the thing is, mo we don't think that if God is not good to us, then he's unjust. We think that if God is unjust to us, that he's unjust. And I'm not just giving you a tautology there. But I might think, and I think I actually would still be wrong about this uh, because I'm sure God has his reasons for this. But if I got cancer, if God allowed me to get cancer, and notice I say allowed me to get cancer, um, I, might, I might think that God's not being good to me. But to command me not to do something, determine that I would do the thing he commanded me not to do, and then hold me responsible for doing the thing that he unchangeably determined that I would do, um, that strikes me as unjust. And the idea that we think we are good, first of all, I don't think that I'm I'm good. I, I think there are things about me that are wretched. Um, I, I'm, I, I deal with that quite a bit. My prayer life is pretty transparent. I, there's no sense in lying to God. And so I have to open up quite a bit about that to God every single day. But that said, uh, if determinism is true, whatever it is that's not good about me is what God wanted not to be good about me. And right. so that itself loops back around to the uh, seeming injustice. Now, as I always say, if I'm wrong about all of this, God, you know, please, God, forgive me. Of course, if I'm wrong about all this, God determined me to be wrong about all this. And I'm not mocking God. I, I would accept Calvinism if I thought Calvinism was true. But I just just looking at this statement here, I think you're expressing what Calvinists think very well, Brenton. And, and um, so I'm not criticizing you, brother. I'm just, I mean, this is a thinking that's out there. But we to, to say that if God is not good to us, then he's unjust. Yeah, it wouldn't be good to us if God operated that way. But it also wouldn't be just. And that's the point, is we think that he's unjust if he's unjust. And we don't think we're good. But if we're not good, he determined we wouldn't be good. Now, I, I want to I conclude with this, uh, this point, um, if you don't mind, um, really defining what free will is from a provisionist perspective. Um, in other words, it, it's, it's one thing for us just to quote unquote attack or criticize our Calvinistic friends. Um, and they just say, well, Piper, it, at least he's putting out there a positive presentation of what he believes the Bible is saying about the character and nature of God and how it works. You guys, um, are just criticizing him, but at least he's, he's taking a stance. Um, now, obviously anybody who watches the program knows that we take a stance too, but for those that watching just this particular broadcast, since I have you here, um, can you give more of a positive presentation from a, 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 a indeterminist perspective as one who knows philosophy and theology? Um, how would we define what true free will looks like um, and, and, and defend it from our perspective? Yeah. So uh, libertarian freedom, as we understand it, what we call free will, libertarian freedom is it, two things. One, the ability to have done other than whatever you ended up doing. Like you can't go back in time and do it again. But at the moment of decision, whatever you decide to do, you really could have done something else. That that is that's there. But at the very least, what libertarian freedom entails is that nothing external to you determines your actions. And we do, I think we do see this in the Bible very, very clearly. So um, if you look at uh 
Cain and Abel, for example. Um, after uh, Cain's sacrifice is not accepted, but before he kills Abel, God speaks to Cain and he says, um, why are you wroth? If, if, you, if, if you do well, will, not your, will, will you not be accepted? In other words, God is communicating to Cain very clearly. Look, you can do better. You can give a better sacrifice than this. And if you do, you'll be accepted. Well, is God, so you've got two options there. Since Cain doesn't end up doing that, but actually ends up murdering his brother. You've got two options there. Either God was just lying to Cain um, by, by telling him he could have done otherwise, or since he doesn't explicitly say it, he's, he's being incredibly deceitful to Cain by implying to Cain that Cain could do better when he knows that Cain won't because Cain isn't determined to do better because Cain has been determined by God to murder his brother. I think that free will is the best explanation of that passage and free will, libertarian free will is the best explanation of multiple other Old Testament and New Testament texts that get discussed on this show all the time. So from a philosophical perspective, libertarian freedom is the ability to have done other than whatever you ended up doing. And at the very least that nothing external to you determines your actions. Um, but determinism says that uh, whatever you ended up doing was what you were determined to do. It's unchangeable. It couldn't have been otherwise. And on Calvinism, it's because of a chain of cause. It's because of a chain that ultimately leads back to God. Um, I was about to say because of a chain of cause and effect, but some Calvinists, again, like our brilliant colleague, Chris Day, will say, no, it's not really causal in that sense. It's more like an author writing a story. But either way, the principal point is that God determines it and it couldn't have been otherwise. Well, Brenton says, well, when God, God gives Cain the options, he is telling the truth. When Cain chooses, he is demonstrating his evil heart. What would you say that? Right, but Brent, Brenton, the thing about it is, if he's telling Cain, if he's giving Cain the impression that it is actually possible that you could give a better sacrifice, but God has unchangeably determined it such that Cain can't give a better sacrifice. Because doesn't, doesn't Abel have the same heart? I mean, both of them are born fallen, right? right. So right. to say that Cain's choice demonstrates his evil heart seems to presume that Abel doesn't have an evil heart. And why doesn't Abel have an evil heart if they're both born under the same sin and of if, Adam? And if Cain does have an evil heart such that he can't and won't choose to give a better sacrifice instead of murdering his brother in cold blood, um, that's because God determined that because God in some sense of want wanted that. Right. And that, that and that becomes the problem, obviously. Um, and and so the, the the thing that I point out when it comes to the philosophical question of free will and determinism, self determination, is just to simply ask the question: Could God, if He wanted to, just 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 suppose? Let's suppose we we don't know which one's right. Supposing we don't know Calvinism or non Calvinism is right, whichever one. But let's just suppose if God wanted to create a world where libertarian free creatures exist. In other words, He wanted to create a world where creatures don't make choices that he himself determines. In other words, he wants them to be self-determining creatures that they are autonomous from him and his determinations. If he wanted to do that, could he? And I always ask that question, could he? And I, in fact, I typed it on the side for Brenton and I don't know if he saw it because I didn't see an answer to it. Um, and, and so I, I, that, that's always what I ask because there's one of two answers, either yes, he could have done that or no, he couldn't have done that. And if they say, no, he couldn't have done that, then you seem to be undermining his omnipotence because apparently God does not have the creative power and ability to create creatures he himself doesn't control, which seems to be a very low view of God if you don't think he has the power to do that. He doesn't have the power to create autonomously free creatures, I guess. And, and very few Calvinists want to come right out and deny God's omnipotence like that. Um, okay, well, here's Britton's answer. He says he doesn't see how. Okay. So because of your finite ability, inability to see how he does it, therefore you assume he can't, is what it sounds like to me. I well, don't know how I, he creates something from nothing. Yeah, and I would say um, creatures are dependent in the sense that they are contingent. They're not necessary beings. God's necessary. They're contingent right. on God for their existence. They won't exist if there's not a God to create and sustain them. But that's a different question from whether they have libertarian freedom. Right. And, and that's and that's the big point is that sometimes when when Calvinists um, talk about, well, you believe man is autonomous and then they'll start talking about your next breath is at his mercy and all these things as if our existence and our continue ability to live 
is not dependent upon his grace or mercy. That's not what we're talking about. Um, my, my ability to breathe is dependent upon God giving me that ability to breathe, but I'm still responsible for whether I use that breath to curse or to praise him. In the same way, my ability to make choices is dependent upon him granting me the ability to live and make choices, but yet I'm still responsible for the choice I make. So we're not talking about the the in de, being independent from God in as it involves our, our existence or our ability to breathe and act and choose. We're talking about our ability to make choices, moral choices that are independent in at least some sense from God's determination. In other words, he's not the decisive cause of what I will choose to do with regard to moral evil. Um, and therefore, if God can't do that, which is what it seems like Calvinists are arguing, I know um, uh, James White has argued that it would be like God creating a rock so big that he couldn't move it. Um, and I've, I've pointed back and say, well, no, it's actually more like God creating a rock he chooses not to move. And God can choose not to move a rock if he, does, if he wants to. Um, and so he can create an agent that he doesn't himself control if he wants to. And, and, and it seems to me a very low view of God to say that God could not create free moral creatures if he wanted to. And, and a lot of Calvinists aren't willing to come right out and deny God's omnipotence like that, which is what it ultimately seems that they're doing. Um, and, and ironically, they're getting really mad at the dynamic folks, the open theist folks, because they're denying his omniscience when at the same time they seem to be denying his omnipotence. And so I, I say, well, let's just not do either one uh, and appeal to the mystery of libertarian free will if we're going to appeal to a mystery at all. I mean, it well, yeah, seems like a better option. Yeah. I think that a Calvinist, you brought up the very point, you know, that from James White, if it were a logical contradiction, omnipotence has never said throughout the history of the church that God can do things that are logically contradictory, like make a square circle, right? That's, that's not a part of om omnipotence. If it were true that libertarian freedom implies um, uh, a logical contradiction, then, then, okay, you can still have omnipotence and say that God couldn't make someone that's libertarianly free. However, then what you have to face is, God could, the, the very creation of the universe, as we said at the top of this show, requires that at least God have libertarian freedom. And as right. we said then as well, if God has libertarian freedom, then in principle, libertarian freedom is not contradictory. And so there's no reason God can't give it to human beings. Yeah, well, well said. Dustin Paulson, thank you for your super chat. He says, Calvinist in the Old Testament couldn't have given free will offerings like this. They could have only given sovereignly determined offerings. Yes. And, and you, I mean, you say that tongue in cheek and funny, but at the same time, that's what a free will offering was. A free will offering was not by compulsion. And if Calvinism's determinism is true, then everything is by compulsion, not in the sense that he's making you do something against what you want, but that he's controlling your wants to make you do something that you wouldn't have wanted otherwise. And that is uh, just another form of compulsion, as far as we can tell, just like the analogy we've used before with regard to the, the woman in a bar and a man walking in and dragging her, kicking and screaming out of the bar. Everybody intuitively said that's wrong. We, we, that, that's not a, the free act of the woman to go with that man out that out the door and everybody would step in to stop. But if he were to secretly s slip something into her drink to make her like a love potion, love the first person she talks to, the first man she talks to. And the man slips that into her drink. She takes the drink. He's the first one who engages her in a conversation. And now she automatically, because of the effects of the potion, loves him and walks out willingly. Every one of us intuitively would say, well, that's still just as wrong. That's still compulsion. That's still not right. You shouldn't do that because she's not acting in accordance with her independent will. She's acting in accordance with the will that he has determined for her to act. And that's not real love. That's not real relationship. That's not real interaction. And so both of those scenarios we would reject as compulsion just because one of them is secret. And because she wants to do that, if he's just, if he's the one controlling her desires, then you can't call that true relationship or true love. She wants to do it. Yeah. In such a scenario, she's doing what she wants and what more do you want than the freedom to do what you want? But her wants have been acted upon by the love potion such that she's doing what she wouldn't have willed, as you said. I, I think that's a good critique of compatibilism there. Well, and the other critique I can hear some people bringing to us is that, well, y'all didn't even talk about any scripture passages. Not really. I mean, you may have referenced one or two here or there, but y'all really didn't exegete the texts um, like John Piper does. Now, again, in this interview, he doesn't exegete any text, really. Uh, he just talks about these, these things. And so there's, there's a place and a time for everything. And we do go through verse by verse exegesis in our books and in our, in our broadcasts. And so that's what I would recommend for those that have that critique is to say, go, go listen to some of our, uh, biblical, um, exegesis and read some of our work on that subject and learn from the provisionists perspective, 
how we would interpret Romans 9, for example, or Ephesians 1, or the leading proof text that's in your mind right now thinking, well, have these guys even, do these guys even know that Acts 13, 48 is there? Do these guys even know that um, John 6, 44 is there? Um, surprise, surprise, yes, we, we do know it's there. <laughs> surprise, surprise, yes, we have dealt with those passages in great length. And we do believe there's a better interpretation than what the deterministic form of compatibilistic Calvinism has to offer. And, and, and I think they're very reasonable. I think they're historically um, uh, uh, supported through orthodoxy, especially the first 400 years of the Christian church that actually sides on the same side we do, which doesn't prove that we're right, but it certainly demonstrates that we have orthodoxy behind us where sometimes we're accused of not having it. Um, and, and, I, and I think there's very reasonable, very smart, very intelligent, very well-intending exegetes from the non-Calvinistic side if people are willing to go beyond the surface level of what seems to be the most popular uh, theological perspective being presented out there by men like John Piper. Um, and so with that said, I, I want to bring this to a close, but I, I want to allow Dr. Hunter to give us uh, any closing last words of, of recommendation from you and, and also uh, tell us a little bit more about where people can find more about you and your broadcast as well. Yeah, I, I've put it in the chat a few times, but I, I would really appreciate anyone who's interested in apologetics. If you're, if you're not, if that's not something that you're interested in, then don't subscribe to the channel. But if you are interested in apologetics and evangelism, I would encourage you to subscribe at um, Trinity Radio. You can just click on my profile image in the chat right now, or perhaps there'll be a link later and you can go there, but just search YouTube for Trinity Radio. And I would really appreciate you subscribing. I'm not nearly as big of a platform as Layton has here, uh, but, uh, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm uh, grateful for anyone that subscribes. And uh, with all of this, I would just say that two things. First of all, I would say that um, I'm glad that Calvinists are believers. Uh, they're my brothers and sisters in Christ, as Layton always says. And um, we can join arms in evangelism toward uh, unbelievers to reach them with the message of the kingdom. And so with, for that, I'm, I'm grateful. And, uh, I, and I don't think as much about this issue as I used to. I do think about free will and determinism because many atheists are determinists. Most atheist naturalists either are or to be consistent with their position should be um, determinists. And so I have a lot about free will there um, if you're interested in that. But when it comes to John Piper, when it comes to Christians who are determinists, I don't I get the notion that we should look at the Bible. And of course, as Layton just said, we've both done that in our written work and in other videos and in blog articles and things like that. Um, and if I thought that uh, the Bible taught what John Piper teaches, then I would be a Calvinist. The thing is, I don't believe the Bible teaches that. And so not only does the Bible not teach that. But when I look at my intuitions about justice and about free will and those sorts of things, it really seems like a part of the design that God has put into me to recognize when something is unjust or to recognize when when I have the freedom to choose. And uh, so I guess I just really realized this today while we were doing this. It came out of my mouth and I think it's true. If what I appreciate about John Piper is he's willing to admit those intuitions are there. He calls them assumptions, but they're deep intuitions. And then he just says, I just don't think the Bible teaches that. But I, I would encourage uh, my Calvinist brothers, if you don't already, to be like John Piper in that respect. And at least admit that you get that deep intuition. Even if you think scripture overwhelms that intuition, that's a different discussion. The intuitions are there. And those intuitions, I think, reveal to us something about the nature of God. And uh, so I appreciate you having me on the program, Layton. I always love coming on your show and uh, believe in what you're doing. Believe this is important because even though as an evangelist, and I know you're an evangelist too, you have an evangelist heart, but my, my deepest issue is I want to see people come to Christ. Secondary doctrinal issues like this one are still vitally important because understanding God's message to the church is vitally important. Well, well said. And um, Braxton Hunter does have a broadcast, a podcast that if you haven't subscribed to, uh, you should go do that. I don't think I put it in the show notes yet, and I will do, do that as soon as we're done here. Sorry about that. I should have put that in the show notes. But um, it would be easy to find him on YouTube if you just typed in even Braxton Hunter, it would come up. But uh, Trinity Radio uh, is the broadcast, um, and uh, you will learn a, a swath of information with, with regard to apologetics. I cut my teeth 
on core facts uh, in apologetics, which is, is Braxton Hunter's work on on the subject and highly recommend core facts uh, if you're looking for an introduction into apologetic ministries Thank you. Um, from from a provisionist perspective even. And so one who holds to uh, what we believe with regard to the libertarian freedom of the will, God's character as one who provides for the, the salvation of, of all people. Um, and, and, and therefore we're trying to, 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 to spread this news, not because we think it's the only most important and, and the only thing that anybody should ever talk about. We just believe that this is obviously, uh, an, an issue that is important to the church. It's very, very, um, uh, highly debated right now, especially in our culture. Uh, Calvinism is, uh, on the rise and it's becoming more and more popular. I know even within my personal domination, and that's one of the reasons we're addressing it. Uh, and trying to do so with respect and love towards our Calvinist friends, having them on the program to speak for themselves, listening to them in their own words. Uh, and we, we we would hope that Calvinists would return the favor. It hasn't been happening very often, at least among the leading Calvinists out there. And maybe maybe we can set a better example for those leading Calvinists like Piper and MacArthur and others to actually engage with the leading scholars from the other perspective versus uh, the caricatures that we often see uh, being put out there about what we believe or what we say. Like those guys think they can save themselves. Those people don't believe that God is sovereign. Those people don't believe that that God's sovereign over salvation. Those people want to try to steal God's glory. These kinds of accusations that are very prominent out there, uh, I think need to be uh, to be pushed back. Um, and um, and and I and I appreciate Dr. Hunter coming on and giving us uh, a, a taste of what we might experience on his program. Caleb Garza, which, by the way, is the one who comes up with these great uh, thumbnails for us. Uh, he says, thanks for sharing your testimony on Trinity the other day. Um, I have not heard that yet. So that makes me want to go and, and listen to that. So uh, it sounds like you, you were able to share your testimony recently on, on Trinity. Well, you're, you're, you're a big part of it, Leighton. Um, for anyone that knows, you, you said you cut your teeth in apologetics on core facts. But the truth is, I was just telling Jonathan yesterday, um, had you not heard about me from my debates with Calvinists, we would not have developed a relationship where you're now at, at Trinity Seminary teaching, but then you would not have invited me to the unapologetics conferences. If you had not done that, I would not have debated atheist Matt Dillahunty. If I had not debated atheist Matt Dillahunty, my channel would have never taken off and I would have never met Cameron Bertuzzi from Capturing Christianity, who's got me debating the world's one of the world's biggest atheist YouTubers this August. So you've played a big role in, in my ministry testimony, at least. Well, I'm I'm honored to be a part of that uh, that testimony. Are honored to be a part of Trinity, uh, which we've we've gone a long time without saying anything about this. But if you're looking for a higher theological education, uh, type in trinitysim.edu. Uh, you can also find a link there at Sociology 101 under the uh, the the class uh, link at the top of the page. Um, and if you want to learn how you can get a higher theological education, a lot of the the places because of COVID, a lot of the schools right now are trying to catch up with places like Trinity because they have to do online education. And Trinity has been doing this for years and years and has perfected it. Uh, and so uh, if you're gonna do online education anyway, might as well do it from a, a, a place that already has it down and, and knows how to do online education and do it really well. And so I, I highly recommend you looking at Trinity Sim if you haven't done so already. And if you have questions about Trinity Seminary, I know Braxton Hunter, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, Braxton Hunter and Jonathan Pritchett, either one would be glad to answer questions about uh, about that and about how you can get a, a higher theological education even right now and for a very affordable price. And so uh, make sure you check those guys out. And there are links in the show note to Trinity Seminary. I know that. So we put those in there on, on YouTube quite regularly. So, um, But thank you, Dr. Hunter, for your time. Thank you guys for tuning in. Appreciate all of you. Remember, if uh, if you'd like to help us spread the news of God's love and provision for all people, in the, in the show notes, there is a support link. Uh, you can support us on a, a monthly basis or uh, a one-time gift, uh, or even better yet, um, share these broadcasts. Right now, if you just like and subscribe and then share this broadcast with other people on your social media page, I really do see the uptick every time one of you posts this on Facebook or on Twitter or on TikTok or where, whatever social media, Snapchat, whatever internet webs are out there nowadays, um, go do it and uh, spread it because that's how the, the word gets out. And so God bless. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.